Good morning and welcome to PW Grocers Environmental Echo. I'm your host, Paul Boyce, CEO and President of PWGC. And as always, we're bringing you guys some exciting, fun topics today with a state assemblywoman, Jody Giglio, from the uh, east end of Long Island. We're going to be talking about some environmental topics and how that's impacting that area of the island and, you know, what's going on and what's coming up. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to let our listeners know the best way to get a hold of us is through our website, which is www.pwgrocer dot com backslash podcast if you guys have questions comments ideas thoughts or uh, potential guests that you want to see or, or hear um, by all means reach out to us we do our best to get back to everybody in a, in a timely and responsive manner and that is the best way to get a hold of us um, so dive right into um, let me just give the intro for our guest today um, on today's episode of the environmental echo we will be discussing environmental news on long island's east end with new york state assemblywoman jody giglio who represents District 2 here on the island, uh, which includes the towns of Riverhead, Southhold, and portions of the town of Brookhaven. Uh, in the Assembly, she's worked to address the region's infrastructure uh, issues, as well as tourism promotion, farmland preservation, and environmental improvement. She's been an advocate for up- upgrading sanitary systems to prevent water pollution, which is something near and dear to P.W. Grocer, and has spoken in opposition to dumping of dredge spoils in the Long Island Sound. Uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about that today. That's yeah. come up again. Um, and Assemblywoman Giglio also supports the use of geothermal systems for heating and cooling of homes, which, oh my gosh, this is going to be great. That's That's been a repeat topic on our show here. Um, and again, it's something that P.W. Grocer and many of our colleagues are, are very interested in and, and, and trying to promote. Um, prior to her being elected to state government, though, uh, Assemblywoman Giglio served as Riverhead Town Councilwoman for 10 years. And, and here's something that I did not know before I met you today is you are a proud member of Local 138 of the International Union of Operating Engineers. Still am, yes. I, 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 I'm picturing you <laughs> operating like a bulldozer or a payloader, and <laughs> that's a, it's an interesting thought, you know. Uh, and you're also a mother of three, and you've lived in the hamlet of Baiting Hollow for the past 20 years. So, Assemblywoman uh, Giglio, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. Um, and also, uh, we have our mainstay on, on our program here is Charlie Bartha, who is a senior vice president in the engineering unit at PW Grocer and is leading a lot of our business development efforts Uh Charlie, as always, I, I love having you here, and it's it's great to see you again. I'm glad to be here, and it's always interesting topics for our, our listeners. Uh, yes, that's that's the idea here. We're trying to be, um, you know, informative, educational, and, and conversational. So with that, let's get right into it with Sem- Assemblywoman Giglio. Again, welcome. Um, you know, let's start off by let's, the North Fork is, you know, essentially facing a, a myriad of challenges at the moment from Um, developmental pressures to environmental issues to obviously preservation efforts. In your opinion, you know, what are the most pressing matters facing your district? Well, right now, the most pressing matters is that everybody from the South Fork and from the city have seemed to relocate permanently to Long Island. So the infrastructure on the island and the water quality and the sanitary systems and everything where they were summer homes, now they're turning into two-story homes or double-size homes. So, you know, that seems to be a big challenge. But it's, uh, I think that Southhold is going to work on the same type of legislation that I worked on when I was in the town board and finally got adopted in 2012, and that is a substantial improvement would require a sanitary upgrade. So, you know, Suffolk County adopted last July that all new homes and any major uh, construction project, you'd have to switch to the IA systems which are the bacteria systems, and I'm sure you're very involved in that. We certainly are, those designing. innovative alternatives, yep. Yeah, and uh, it's so that's a good thing, but we still have uh, many um, problems on Long Island as we live on Long Island and Shelter Island and Fishers Island with nitrogen into the groundwater and then how it affects the algal blooms and the rivers and the lakes and all the way out to the bay, so... And, and I know that we're going to be talking about the dredging soon, too. But oh, yeah. the, the pressures of development, it really, um, if it's done wisely, then that's a good thing. And, you know, the fact that Suffolk County adopt a uniform code now for sanitary disposal of single-family dwellings is a good thing. Well, I, I, you brought up a great point to start. And that's, you know, housing and development and everything else sort of post-pandemic, you know, right? Everybody, you mentioned it, flocked out of the city to, to, to get more open space. 
Um, you know, I've been out to the North Fork numerous times. I haven't made it out there this fall yet, but I, I understand traffic is always a concern. Oh, yeah. Um, do you feel that it's becoming saturated with development yet? Or I, I know there's still a lot of farmland and open space in the vineyards, and it's, it's you know, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous and beautiful country. And I, my opinion, you know, we, we need to do a lot to preserve it. Yeah. So Riverhead definitely did our part in preserving farmland. Um, the Community Preservation Fund, as a matter of fact, uh, Riverhead borrowed $80 million a long time ago to preserve open space and farmland, which they're still paying back that debt. So they were, the CPF fund was operating at a deficit. So all the money that we took in from the mortgages and from the closing of properties was going to pay back that debt. And we were always short having to pull from the general fund to pay back that debt. I think now it's finally caught up where we'll have ex- actually extra money in the Community Preservation Fund to start preserving again. But Riverhead is really a model for the, you know, taking the leap of faith and, and actually borrowing that money and preserving all that land. That, that was really a big move because real estate at that time was priced right. And now with everything going up so much, um, but it also has helped the Community Preservation Fund with all the sales and that uh, tied into that. So Yeah. Although I heard... Assemblyman Thiel on the radio the other day that this year's uh, revenue is down slightly. Yeah, um, it's probably it, I think it was eighty million as opposed to one hundred and twenty million last year, approximately. Yeah, well, you know the, the like I said, the South Fork has become very congested. It's been in the yep. news with the traffic, and you know once you, you have people sitting in traffic for two hours, uh, it's it's not good for anybody. So a lot of people have found their way to the North Fork, to the wine country, and to the farms and the vast open space. So we're seeing a lot of development and a lot of people that are, like I said, are converting their summer homes from, you know, that used to come out from New York City to their summer homes and now are taking permanent residency. So it's uh, really impacting the school district. It's it's impacting the water, how much water you can actually produce. Um, the, the Suffolk County Water Authority and the Riverhead Water District are pumping more water than they ever have before, and especially during the pandemic with everybody washing their hands and constantly washing their groceries as they're coming in the door and, you know, all the water that's being used. And the state has really come down on the um, parts per trillion that you have to maintain. I think they moved it down to 10 parts per trillion for the PFAS and the PFOS. You so, are correct. So yeah. it's, a, it's a constant battle, and the money just needs to get back to the water district so that they can maintain, you know, it's, it's good policy. It's great policy to put on paper, but it's, it means nothing unless you can implement it. And you got to, you know, show the money. Where's the money? Because that's the only way that we're going to get this water treated and, and get people clean water. Well, you're bringing up a great topic with the water quality, but you also touched on the quantity. Um, especially, you know, once you get east of Riverhead on that North Fork, it becomes very sensitive with saltwater intrusion. You yeah. Know, it's, um, so you, you, they really, it gets tricky if the, you're putting more and more people out there. It's going to be more and more demand or, you know, for water supply. Um, and, and we do work very closely with the Water Authority and some of the local water providers here on Long Island, and uh, conservation is always a big issue. Um, but, you know, if we further development, you know, we, we, we continue to develop out there like that, you know, which... You know, it's got its pros and cons, but water is, um, it's critical. You know? It is. Um, so what do we do to address water supply? Not just treatment of it, but making sure people have enough <laughs> if we're, we're going to, you know. Yeah. Well, it, that's what interesting about the legislation that I put forth in 2012 is that a lot of people were at, they'd had a two-bedroom bungalow, but then they were building a second floor on. So then the first floor became this gorgeous kitchen with a, with a you know, laundry room and the dishwasher where they never had that before so and then the upstairs became the bedroom so they were getting through the health department not having to go there because they were still under the four bedroom threshold Mm -hmm. which is why i put the law on for the substantial improvement if it was more than the 50 percent of the assessed value then they'd have to upgrade the sanitary because a lot of these sanitary systems were sitting in groundwater they were block systems from the 70s so that was uh Good, and I think South Hold is looking at uh, legislation right now to prohibit what they would call McMansions, these bungalows turning into McMansions, because of the difficulties that they have in not only serving water, but the depth to groundwater with the nitrogen for the conventional systems. That's all right in our wheelhouse. Yeah. But uh, water supply is a big issue. We're working on a number, (coughs) excuse me, 
a number of projects in the Riverhead area and water supply working closely with the uh, Riverhead Water District as well as the Riverhead Sewer District in order to provide those things. The things people don't like to think about typically. You know, yeah, they just always have water and mm-hmm. flush the toilet. Yeah, yeah, they take it for granted. And, and there is a lot of development pressure right now that's happening in uh, – Riverhead, and it's amazing when I was on the town board, you know, we would get reports about a new development and say, yes, you know, extend the water district to include that property (laughs) so that they could build, but not knowing that the DEC hadn't approved any of those permits all along the way. And by the time the DEC, we got to developing the um, former Grumman property, Enterprise Park at Calverton, uh, it, it, it came to a big you know, our heels are in the, yep. uh, our heels are digging in and we're not letting you go forward unless you show us how you're going to provide public water, not only to this development, but to make sure that everybody around it is still protected, which is a good thing. And it's, and it's been an exercise that Riverhead's been struggling with, but I think they're finally getting to the end to where they're, you know, putting in new holding tanks and, and things of that nature. They've got some infrastructure upgrades I know they're, they're looking forward to for sure. Yeah, yeah. So. and it's, um, you know, the DEC is, is really, like I said, there, I think there were 30, 17 maybe water main extensions outside of the district that never had permits through the DEC. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, it's definitely an issue that came to our attention <laughs> late in the game. And th- there's some... Call it competition between the Suffolk Water Authority and the Riverhead Water District as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, Suffolk County Water Authority has always had their eye on the Enterprise Park at Calverton because it's proposed for a 10 million square foot build out of uh, commercial and industrial. And uh, and they're battling with that now also because the qualified and eligible for Triple Five that everybody's familiar with was all about aviation hub and yep. high tech. And now it seems that it gets going to be, you know, 10 million square feet of warehouse space with, um, you know, cargo planes coming in and uh, trucks leaving and vans leaving. So I know the town of Riverhead Town Board is struggling with that, and I'm I'm having the conversations with them because that was not the original intent. Well, hopefully it all works out for sure. Yeah. Uh, and while we're on this topic, you know, Long Island, we were went through, and maybe we still are in this, you know, even though it just rained like, you know, build an arc the last couple of days. Um, we had severe to moderate drought this summer, mm. you know, which would certainly have an effect on water demand, water supply, uh, the suppliers' abilities to, you know, keep up with the demand, plus fire protection and things like that. Did you guys, I mean, I know the town of Riverhead specifically was struggling this summer. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, even the farmers, too, because we do yeah. have a big agricultural community, and uh, it was it was difficult for everybody. It's... um. And you have to wonder, I mean, some people say it's global warming. Mm -hmm. Other people say it's just a a cycle, the cycle, the environmental cycle. So it's, um, it was difficult for the farmers and then for the town in order to, uh, you know, when you have to tell people odd and even days for your watering your lawn and to not water your lawn between, you know, 5 a.m. and, you know, 7 p.m. and things like that which were the peak times and also getting a lot of the commercial properties to switch over to irrigation wells rather than using the public water. How do you find other members of the assembly uh, as far as appreciating the issues we're dealing with on Long Island with respect to environment? (laughs) It's funny that you say that because I, when I, I go through some of the portfolios of some of my members in the assembly and it, it appears as though they are just very well liked in their communities and that's why they were elected, but they really have very little experience when it comes to development and environment and um, law, law enforcement. Uh, they are, um, how do I say it, very knee-jerk reactions to certain things that happen rather than thinking about how the end result will turn out. And uh me being a, having my own business since 1997, my own construction company, and building a lot of houses and building in New York City and being a member of the operating engineers, you you really have to, when you put the shovel in the ground, you have to know every step along the way and what the end result is going to be. And I feel like a lot of the legislators in Albany, both on the Assembly and the Senate, have very little experience in actually looking at something from start to finish and what the end result may be. I would imagine is a downstate perception. It's New York City, and we're just, 
you know, extension of New York City. They don't realize the environment that we have here. Yeah. Yeah, they don't, but I have uh, I've made a few friends in the assembly on the other side of the aisle that have come out here to Long Island and, and seen what we have, and they're amazed because mm-hmm. they they think that we are, um, you know, they I, I don't want to say it because it sounds kind of racist as to what they think like Long Islanders are, but where, with the difference between the hurdles that they have in New York City or Queens, um, the five boroughs. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, but they were very surprised to come here and see the diversity and the cultural aspects that we have of Long Island and how we appreciate mm-hmm. diversity and we appreciate the environment and protection. And they they don't understand, they're, they're looking at, I mean, for example, they adopted a legislation that said that you can't use lead bullets to hunt in state parks. Uh, because the water streaming down from upstate Damn. into the city <laughs> would be affected okay. by the lead. So it's. I was uh, trying, I was had a hard time drawing that mm-hmm. connection, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, and then you know they create different laws for Nassau and Suffolk County than they do for mm-hmm. anywhere else throughout the state. Like, for example, here with hunting, we can't use rifles. Well, they, and I'm not a hunter, but they didn't they do that a while ago with uh, for hunting ducks on Long Island. Yep. Well, not with the lead. The lead no. is the new thing. Yeah, lead is the new thing. And, uh, you know, just they, they had the referendum last year with the clean air and a healthy environment, healthful environment, clean air, water, and a healthful environment. But I, I, people don't realize the impact that that has. Of course, mm-hmm. it's a great title. Everybody wants clean air, water, and a healthful environment. But when it comes to you know, land that's next to a manufacturing facility that the county or the town or the state buys to make a park out of it. And now they're trying to shut down the manufacturer because he's polluting the clean air, water, and healthful environment of the park on the land that nobody wanted that they built a park on. So I really feel like the state efforts are focused on getting rid of private business and having everybody work for the government. Every bill that I see... That's what it, it just rings in my mind that that's what they're trying to do is just make it harder and harder for the small business guy or even the big business guy to be successful. And then this whole electric, everything electric really concerns me because at the flip of a switch, they could just turn off your air conditioning, turn off your heat, turn off your car. And uh, so that those things really concern me. That's a, that's a topic that's coming up that I wanted to talk about is some of these alternative energy and clean energy. But before we get to that, um, the, the two that were most interesting to me when we were talking about, you know, in, in your intro was the, the dredge spoils and the geothermal. Mm. So let's just go right to the dredge spoils and the, and the Long Island Sound. What's, what's your take on that and, and your opinion and your thoughts? It, it was a 10-year battle between New York State and, and Connecticut. Yep. And, uh, you know, you have these, the, they want the maritime com- commerce in Connecticut, which is perfectly understandable, but the dredge spoils to put them off of, you know, a thousand feet off of Fisher's Island, which has the most productive eelgrass beds in the whole state of New York. You're, you know, all the money that's spent by the EPA and by the New York State DC and by, you know, local communities, Peconic Estuary Program to protect and to create eelgrass beds, which are a, a significant carbon reducer, is, um, you know, it's it's the largest eelgrass bed in the state of New York. And they're going to dump dredge spoils that from a thousand years of industrial waste that has been, you know, sediment sitting right out there. And they're going to dump it right smack in the middle of... Uh, you know, right in the middle of the sound, which has the most turbulent currents. And uh, it's just, it's so bad, especially since the last 10 years when the lawsuit started, they decided to hold open the existing dredge spoil sites for another 25 years. So why wouldn't they just go back and dump there? And that's my call to the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers. Is well, that, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. What's the solution? Instead of yeah. putting it right there off of Fisher's Island, what yeah. do we do with it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really tough subject because it's got to go somewhere. And everybody says, yeah. not in my backyard. And understandably so. It's, to- it's toxic. So I think that the existing dredge sites and monitoring and maintaining those uh, and and watching what's happening on those existing dredge sites rather than creating new dredge sites. It's just, uh, and they say it's a matter of convenience and, you know, they're not going to have to 
package up into barrels and truck the spoils elsewhere, which could be very expensive. But, you know, Connecticut is the benefit of most of the dollars that come for environmental protection. I think they got $40 million last year, $40 million this year, you know, where New York State sees very little of that money. So, uh, it, in my opinion, they have the money, but if they were to barrel it up and take it out of state, you know, where would it go? Just create a problem somewhere else. So I, I, I agree with you. I, I don't think this becomes just a Long Island issue. It becomes a state issue. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. And, and to Charlie saying, what about your colleagues in the, in the assembly? Are any of them concerned about this, or is it just really local to Long Island? Or, you know, if somebody from Buffalo is doesn't even have an idea. No, they really don't have an idea. And it is unique. Long Island is a very unique place. I mean, really, if you look throughout the state of New York, there's very few, uh, hur- you know, communities that are facing the same hurdles that we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So We are an island unto ourselves, as they yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> we are. But we, you know, and you have Engelbright there, who is a, you know, he's pretty, very extreme about the environment as to how we're going to uh, make it better. But it's, um, he and I don't see eye to eye in everything, but we can we can get along and we can talk about the issues and we can come together on certain things for sure. Yeah, he's been an environmental advocate for a long time. Yeah, I mean the electric cars where New York State, no manufacturer in New York State can sell an electric car after 2035. Oh, you mean gas car? I mean, I'm sorry, gas car. Yeah, yeah. They no, they want to switch all to electric by 2035, and it's yep. and and what how I look at that is how I looked at 10 years ago when the state came in and told all gas stations you have to now put the dikes underneath the tanks that are in ground. Mm-hmm to protect the groundwater. And a lot of gas stations you saw just went out of business because the cost was um, not, it, it just it was wasn't. tough. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of those gas stations went out of business and the cost of gas for the capital cost to do that came back to us. And a lot of how I govern is looking that the laws that we're making that are going to cost businesses more money is only going to add on to our cost to buy that product. So but they don't look at it that way. They think that you could just make money. A lot of people that haven't been in business. I, I think it's, it's certainly one thing to provide incentives for th- yes. these things. But to have these firm deadlines that are somewhat arbitrary um, and to put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. And the same thing with buildings. You know, And we're very big with geothermal heating and cooling, which you have less waste products. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have the, like, you know, electric and batteries for the cars. Yeah. Uh, What's going to happen when people have to get rid of these batteries? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great initiative for new homes to use the geothermal and to use the alternative energy-producing efficiencies rather than going to oil or going to gas, natural gas, because that's all going to go away, folks. They they put a moratorium on natural gas a couple years ago for new development, and um, so I think that they're phasing it out. And it's going back to the point that I was talking about before with the gas stations. Once they say that you can only buy an electric vehicle, you think gas prices are high now. Think about what it's going to be, what it's going to cost to get gas and fuel onto Long Island. Mm -hmm. That's something I didn't think of. For the permits, just to get over the bridge into Long Island, the permits are going to cost a fortune and that's going to come back on us. And, And you think, you know, $5 a gallon is high now. If you want to keep your 1957 Chevy or your 68 vet, you're going to be paying 10 to $15 a gallon for gas if they decide that New York should only have electric vehicles. Wow. If you can find yeah. a gas station. Yeah, right. The classic cause. That's certainly a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Same with my gas guzzling uh, Ram truck, huh, Charlie? Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I better build a fuel tank in my backyard. But I think uh, that the incentives are right for the geothermal and for new homes. But moratoriums on gas for new commercial buildings is not something that I could support. And, uh, you know, it is a clean form of energy. So if we're looking at protecting the environment, uh, natural gas is a clean <laughs> clean source of energy. Seems like it. Well, it's it's interesting because we've been in discussions with National Grid. They, they're the gas company, right? Mm-hmm. They're looking to get out of the gas game. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. They, they want to – they're, they're – pushing these alternative energies and, and fuel sources, uh, just like geothermal. Yeah. You know, so that there's people less relying on it, so you're not, you're not burning that, that you know, fossil fuel, if you will, mm-hmm. um, the, the hydrocarbons and, and the, and the you know, methane of the natural gas. 
and you're the engineer. So, you know, with the geothermal, you just have to think about if how deep you're going to go with the system because when you're talking about the temperature of the earth and everything yeah. else that's changing, you have to really predict hundreds of years into the future. Well, this is what we try to do. We do a lot of detailed modeling, like numerical modeling. Um, and we, we go out and we thermally um, test the ground, too, before we put these systems in to make sure, you know, we, we have an idea of what's like how it's going to react in terms of heat rejection and heat absorption and all that fun stuff. So we, we do design these things, right? We, we look out, you know, at least 50 plus years. <laughs>